Hey, good morning. Let me uh, apologize for something. I uh, uh, often try to get these podcasts uploaded early in the morning so that they're available early, early in the morning. And uh, um, However, I am a bit subject to our internet here at the house uh, with those uploads. And sometimes uh, it just crawls along or it gets stuck somewhere and hangs up and I have to start it over. And so what I've generally tried to do is upload them overnight so that they are uh, ready the next morning and that kind of a thing. However, sometimes I'm not able to necessarily get enough of a jump to get them done a day early. So uh, I'm not casual about it. I'm not uh, flippant about getting stuff out there. I, I appreciate very much that you all uh, watch and, and, and interact and all those kinds of things. And I didn't want you to think that i um, getting lazy or sloppy about it. Unfortunately, I just... Uh, um, yeah, they say a poor workman blames his tools, so I hate to sound like that. I just, uh, but I'm um, doing my best to make sure that they're always consistent. And uh, and if one's not up uh, at a normal time, uh, it's either because I just had too much to do that day and I literally couldn't get to it, uh, or I just somehow fell in, in a bad time of trying to upload or didn't get it done early enough to do it overnight. So I apologize for that. I'm always trying to do better on my end of that kind of a thing, but just wanted to apologize um, uh, if that's ever frustrating on the receiving end of these things, um, just know that I'm aware of it, and, and, and it's, believe me, it's not a casual thing. I just sometimes just happens. So, okay, well, that being said, uh, why don't you join me in turning to Acts chapter 10 for this um, huge change, turn, uh, uh, another enormous event in the history of the early church. This is where the gospel comes to the Gentiles now officially. Uh, we saw it in Jesus' ministry where he would go to the Samaritans who were part Jewish, part Gentile. We saw it in uh, Philip speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, the Ethiopian was a proselyte to Judaism, uh, and so therefore he was ethnically uh, a Gentile. And uh, he receives the gospel there under uh, Philip's, um, you know, leading him to the Lord. But as a as a change now, as a switch, uh, or as an opening, I should say, not a switch, but an opening the door to the Gentiles as a people group, uh, the gospel going outside uh, of, of, of those Messianic Jews who had put their trust in Christ. This now becomes an enormous moment. And so we're going to look at it today. And, and um, some chapters in Scripture um, really... Uh, of necessity need to be read in their entirety. So I apologize again in advance a little bit, a lot of apologizing today. I apologize for that, apologizing so much of the apologies. But uh, chapter 10 is one of those chapters that don't, that doesn't really break up into parts very well. It's really needs to be read. So what I'm going to do is go through the passage and, uh, and comment as we go through. But my intention is to go all the way through the chapter, uh, chapter 10 today. And uh, so if we go a little bit long, uh, that's why, because it just uh, it just seems like a shame to break this chapter up, so I want to not do that. So here we are in chapter 10. If you remember, uh, Peter uh, ultimately laid hands on Tabitha, uh, who is known as Dorcas. Her name means gazelle. She was there in the city of Joppa, uh, where Peter healed her and brought her back uh, from the dead. She had died, and he brought her back to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he was there in Joppa during that period of time, and he was staying in the house of a man named Simon. Interesting. Peter's name is Simon. However, this Simon is Simon the Tanner or Simon the Leather Worker, somebody who was, um, you know, uh, worked with, with animal skins and that kind of a thing, which, as we mentioned last time, is significant because that interaction with, um, you know, with animal skins and that had carried with it um, this, uh, this cost of making you unclean to participate in, uh, in various, uh, you know, Jewish holy days and high days and those kinds of things. And so Peter is already beginning to sort of, uh, find himself in situations where, um, where his kosherness, if I may, uh, is, is sort of being considered a little bit. He's, th I don't know if he's thinking about that necessarily as much as he's about to, uh, but he's about to be confronted with uh, a very important lesson as the history of the church begins to take on a new shape uh, by the Holy Spirit through the hands of Peter, who is wrestling or will wrestle with this question of clean, unclean Gentiles and such. And so here we go. At Caesarea, ch chapter 10, verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Now, as a centurion, Cornelius 
sent, the uh, root word there of centurion, speaks of somebody who's in charge of a hundred men. And so uh, he is a man of authority. Not terribly unlike the centurion um, from Capernaum that we saw earlier uh, in the Gospels, who comes to Jesus one day and asks uh, that he come, or asks him to provide for the healing of someone in his household. And so Jesus is about to make his way there when the centurion, in that case, stops him and says, look, you don't even need to come. I'm, a, I'm an authority. Again, as a centurion, he's in charge of 100 men. Uh, essentially, when I tell my men to jump, they say, how high? Uh, if you just speak to this thing right from here even, it'll be done. And so Jesus, of course, responds, I've not even seen this kind of faith in Israel. He's speaking to a Gentile whom he is gracious to and whom he provides for that healing in that uh, centurion's household. And so um, centurions oftentimes uh, in the course of the Gospels, other than when we get to the crucifixion in that, uh, one centurion stands out and says, surely this is the Son of God, and he, as he sees all the events taking place around Jesus' death. Other than the rest of the centurions in that particular uh, scene, uh, during the, the scourgings and all of those things, most of the time, the other centurion, I think all the time, other than that, the centurions are generally painted in a pretty good light. Uh, they, they are seen as people who, like Cornelius, um, you know, um, are just shown in a positive light. If I may, I'll just jump back into the story here. But uh, here, Cornelius, a centurion, again, man over 100 men, was known uh, over what is known as the Italian cohort. A cohort, again, speaks of a much larger group of soldiers, but he's an authority figure within that group. He's a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to all the people, and he prayed continually to God. Now, this is Luke's way of saying that this is somebody who was not Jewish. He had not become a proselyte to Judaism, but as an outsider, as a Gentile, he was somebody who prayed to the God of Israel, uh, or at least he had a sincerity about a desire to know God. But the, the implication is that he's praying to the right God in this case. He's also somebody who was very generous in giving to the poor and that kind of a thing. Uh, and he was also a very devout man. He feared God. He had a healthy reverence for God. And not only that, but he was an example to his household who also uh, uh, were devout as well. And so uh, in verse 3, at about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. Again, in Joppa, we said last time it's a, it's a coastal city. It's actually uh, known today as Jaffa. I think it's the same area or even the same city. It goes by the name Jaffa today, which is more familiar to us probably in our day. Um, and he's lodging by one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. By the way, you may also remember Joppa as playing a part in Jonah's uh, uh, story in that. Um, you can read uh, Jonah as well to sort of get a sense of his um, compare uh, his activity around that area. And, and sometimes comparisons are made in terms of contrast between uh, Jonah in that situation and Peter in this situation. But for time's sake, let me just go ahead and move on here. Now the next day, verse 9, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the, on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. And this happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. A couple things there that kind of can't go without making mention of. First off, there seems to be something with threes, with Peter. Three denials, thrice restored. Here, three times this vision is given to Peter. And three times, or twice at least, he says essentially no. And so 
I guess it doesn't say he said no each of those times, but if the scene played out a couple of times, it may be the case. But we know at least once he rejected it. And that's the other thing. It's interesting. He says, no, Lord, again. Uh, those are two concepts that should never go together. No and Lord. Not so, Lord. How can he be Lord if you say no, right? Uh, and so, but Peter just, again, he's, we relate to Peter. Uh, at least I can. I'm sure, I, I, I'm sure you can as well. Peter is everybody. He's just like you and me. He, uh, he shoots from the hip. He responds sort of on instinct and all that before he necessarily gets his brain in gear and thinks through what he's doing and saying. He's kind of impetuous that way. And in that way, he sort of gets himself in trouble, but he's kind of endearing to us in a way because we can relate to that. We oftentimes, you know, fire before we aim kind of a thing. And that's, that's, that's definitely Peter. Well, here in this situation... God is using Peter. Uh, you remember, after those uh, denials, uh, the dogs say hello. Uh, after the denials, you know, Jesus restores Peter fully and talks to him about who he's going to be used to feed his sheep. Uh, Peter has a long history serving the body of Christ throughout the years that followed. Uh, the letters that he writes toward the end of his life, he's writing as from sort of an elder statesman sort of a position here, speaking to the body of Christ. Uh, and sharing so many very important, insightful things, both on a practical basis, but also in so many other ways. Um, and so Peter is somebody who God is not finished with, clearly. Um, not only is Peter um, this pillar in the church, but one of the reasons he's a pillar in the church is because of the episode that's about to happen right now. Uh, as, as God gives him this vision, Jesus apparently is the one speaking to him in this, where, uh, where, where Peter is essentially is told to, 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 to rise, kill, and eat. And what's on this sheet, something like a sheet, comes down with all these animals on it that are unclean to Peter. They're things that Peter would never eat because kosher law forbid them. And so as a good kosher Jew, he is naturally responding in the negative. He's, he's stunned by this. He may not even believe this vision that he's seeing, that something is telling him to eat this. Uh, and so he naturally says no. And so the word comes back where Jesus says, what I have made clean, don't call unclean. And that becomes the point of this whole vision. Uh, it is to stretch Peter outside of that which he had come to know and rightly understand. I mean, this was a correct behavior for the Jews up to this point because things now have changed. When Jesus came into the world, he didn't come to destroy the law, but as he said, he came to fulfill it. And so therefore, when it comes to the, uh, the law, uh, and this is a gigantic uh, point and, and worthy of more time than we'll spend just today on it, um, but Paul spends a good deal of time in Colossians. As a matter of fact, the very first church council in church history that takes place in Acts chapter 15 as a result of this very event uh, ultimately helps to pave the way for the understanding that the law had run its course. It was completed in Christ. And so therefore, and this is something Peter comes to grips with later on in verse 34 and 35 and such, but Peter comes to realize that for a Gentile to come to faith in Christ, he doesn't have to come through the law. But in fact, God saves a Gentile by faith through his grace the same way as they were saved. They weren't saved by the works of their, uh, by obeying the works of the law, as Paul would say, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that, you know, uh, if, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died for nothing. And so it's important to recognize that this is an absolutely seminal moment in the church's history, both in terms of the Gentiles being welcomed now into fellowship, being grafted into the vine, but also in terms of understanding the place of law and grace. As a matter of fact, we've said this before, but grace has always been the means by which God saved. The law never had the ability to save anybody, not because the law was less than perfect, it was absolutely perfect, but that was the problem for us personally, because we're in the flesh, we're incapable of keeping the law. So therefore, we have a conundrum, a problem, an absolute uh, an issue that cannot be resolved, if not for the grace of God. And so, um, so Peter is now being forced to reconcile with this idea that something new is going on here and he needs to get over 
kind of move now beyond that which has been uh, the way he's understood things previously. And again, rightly understood them previously to a point. But now all of a sudden we find ourselves in a new, uh, a new age. Not the new age, by the way, but a new age, biblically speaking. And so, verse 17, Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision uh, that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were, at the, uh, uh, were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise, go down, and accompany them without hesitation, or really without making distinction. These were Gentiles who had come to him. And uh, and the Holy Spirit is telling Peter, don't hesitate to go with them. Like, don't not go with them because they're Gentiles. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit... Um, begins to let him know that this is of him, that this is something he needs to go do. Uh, For I've sent them. Verse 21. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you, to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. And so they come in and spend the night. The next day, they'll make their way back uh, there to uh, Caesarea. Now, it is significant that the Holy Spirit gives Peter this vision because it's entirely possible. Uh, And you can almost kind of hear it in their explanation of what's going on. We're here on behalf of Cornelius. By the way, all the Jews speak highly of him. Like they're kind of feeling like they might need to convince Peter to come. And the Holy Spirit giving Peter this vision not only instructed him about this change that was beginning to take place, but it's entirely possible that the Holy Spirit told these things to Peter also so that he would be prepared when this knock at the door came and he wouldn't be resistant. Uh, the Holy Spirit again finishes by saying, don't hesitate to go with them. Show no distinction. Don't, don't not go because they're Gentiles. And so they come in and spend the night. Now the next day he rose and went away with them And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. This will turn out to be helpful because when this event takes place, it's good that there are other witnesses there to corroborate what took place because this whole thing is not well received initially by everybody back in Jerusalem when they start to talk about it. And so some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, he entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and they called together with his relatives and close friends. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. In other words, don't, don't, don't bow down to me. This is, by the way, exactly the right posture for a servant of Christ. Somebody who doesn't uh, get the accolades, somebody who's not interested in being bowed down to, somebody who is simply a servant of the Lord. We talked about this previously, the idea that a stewardship's been given to us, a responsibility with whatever it is that God has called us to, and we are servants and stewards. Servant speaks to the posture. Steward speaks to the responsibility. Uh, to take that responsibility on, on with a very humble Christ-like posture. You know, not, not you know, expecting pats on the back or, uh, or, or labels or to be seen as something special in and of ourselves, but rather as an under rower. Somebody who's insignificant in our, own, in our own sight. We're not insignificant to the Lord. But our attitude should be the one of, of feeling like, look, this is not about me. This is about him. And so Peter uh, says, stand up. I too am a man. By the way, it's interesting that the angels in the book of Revelation, when John bows down to one of them, says pretty much the same thing. Even an angel, pretty heavy hitting dude, uh, recognizes, no, I'm not to be worshipped or bowed down to. This is something for the Lord alone. So Peter recognizes this. Verse 27, and as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So Peter understands the vision was not about just eating foods that weren't considered kosher. It's actually, it actually has to do with people. God has taught Peter that people ought not to be seen differently even if they're not Jewish, but they need to be recognized as being important to the Lord. And the gospel is now about to come to them and they're about to receive it. And so I should not call any person common or unclean. Verse 29, so when I was sent for, I came without objection. And I ask you then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour 
Uh, by the way, it's about three in the afternoon. I should have mentioned that earlier. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. This is the angel that uh, Cornelius saw earlier. Uh, in bright clothing and said, to, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. And so I send for you at once and you have uh, been kind enough to come. And so Cornelius recognizes, like Peter said, the, the, the Gentiles understood that Jews were not really supposed to go into the house of a Gentile. And so Cornelius appreciates that Peter responded uh, to the call to come. Now, Cornelius doesn't necessarily know at this point that Peter had a vision and all this stuff has happened, except that, you know, Peter has just told him, but Cornelius was not aware of that prior to this moment. All he knew is he was sending for Peter, and he's just glad Peter came. And so, uh, I sent for you at once, and you've been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Now, for those of us who preach and teach and stuff, this is called right down the middle. This is, this is you know, teed up and ready to go. This is, this is the perfect pitch, you know. And so Peter goes ahead and opens his mouth. Now, whether Peter had been thinking about what he was going to say or not, we don't know. But what he lays out here is just simply put, he explains a bit of the gospel. So Peter opens his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, everyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news, uh, preach, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he's basically alluding to the fact that what happened with Jesus is well known throughout this whole area. Uh, it is common knowledge what took place with Jesus there. That doesn't mean everybody believes, but people are aware of what happened. Uh, it's interesting. Of course, it was much fresher at the time, but on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, uh, when Jesus, unbeknownst to these two disciples, uh, that it's him, he's walking with them and he says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And their response is, what are you, are you like new in these parts? Do you not know what's been going on here? And, you know, and, and all this. And so, uh, you know, so Peter is just simply pointing out, look, you know full well what all happened there. How Jesus came filled with the Holy Spirit and with power and it continues. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. By When it says he was appointed by them, you remember the Great Commission. Go out into all the world, all the world and make disciples of the nations. And so there's already in that uh, great commission the understanding that it was going to go out beyond just the Jews, although they may not have understood it at the time. But under where we are here now, seeing what's unfolding, it probably is beginning to click to Peter that, oh, this great commission is actually not just for the Jews. And based on what's about to happen, I'll realize that it's not even for Gentiles who come through Judaism but something brand new is about to happen here. Again, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the peoples, or all the prophets, I should say, bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Like the prophets all said. In other words, the Old Testament, as Jesus rightly said, spoke of him. Now, verse 44, and here we go. While Peter was still saying these things, in other words, he had not even finished. He hadn't given a gospel presentation. He hadn't, or an invitation, I should say, right? He'd been presenting the gospel. But he didn't even say, okay, now bow your heads, you know, close your eyes, calm your hearts, and let's, he didn't even get to any of that stuff. While he was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. 
In other words, the Jews who came with Peter, those believing in those Jews who believed in Christ, Messianic Jews who had accompanied him from Joppa, they saw what was happening and they realized that the Holy Spirit had fallen upon these people, Gentiles, in their house, without anything about coming through Moses or any of this stuff. The Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he had fallen upon the disciples there on the day of Pentecost. And they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Shocking, right? For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Now, there, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit as he fell upon these believers was that of speaking in tongues uh, uh, and extolling God, which is what tongues is. It is a language by which we glorify God and that kind of thing, as we saw in, in Acts chapter 2. Now, what we ought not take from this is that this is how it looks for everybody who believes. Not everybody who believes speaks in tongues and begins to glorify God in, in, a, in an unknown language. Um, but in some cases, we do see it in the New Testament. Uh, we didn't see it with the Ethiopian eunuch. We don't see it in a lot of times when uh, people are coming to Christ and that kind of thing. But in a couple of cases, we do. And so this just becomes an evidence where these Jews who came to the Gentiles and brought them the gospel, the fact that they believed had, was now immediately visibly or verbally uh, testified to by the fact that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been given to them. And so they are now in new territory. This is kind of a new area. We, we don't really know what to do with this yet, but it just happened. And so verse 47, Peter declares... Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked him to remain for some days. And so no doubt during those days, Peter began to give them a better understanding of what the gospel was all about, what it meant now to walk with Jesus, uh, what had just happened to them, you know, explaining the gift of the Holy Spirit and such. And so this becomes an enormous, again, an enormous moment in the church. No longer is the gospel predominantly believed by Jews who were awaiting their Messiah and now had received him, but even those outside of the commonwealth of Israel had now begun to come. Uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to go ahead and turn with me to um, Isaiah in the Old Testament, because it's, it's good for us to see that God's love for the Gentiles has always been there. As a matter of fact, uh, even prior to Isaiah, we can go, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Who does God call first to become one of his, uh, to become his follower and ultimately become the, the root of the Jewish nation? But Abraham. The Hebrew faith began with Abraham. Well, what was Abraham before he was a Jew? He was a Gentile. Right? God called him out of the world, out of the nations, and made his own special people out of him. So God has always loved the, uh, the, the Gentiles. But here we see it as well, uh, and I'll, in particular, um, in uh, uh, Isaiah... Uh, 55, I believe, right? Uh, 55 or 57. I should have jotted this down before we got here because I, I didn't, I just came to mind now as we were, uh, I think it might be 57 actually. Um, let's see. Oh, see, this is why you got to write stuff down before you get there. Uh, maybe it's 56, 55 it is, I think. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, shoot. I can't believe I did that. I'll put it in the notes. There's a passage here in Isaiah 55 or 57, um, and uh, I'll put it in the notes for you. But here it talks about, um, let the foreigner who wants to join himself to the Lord, you know, and, uh, and, and such. There's an invitation to those even outside of Israel in the Old Testament. Again, the idea of proselytes uh, to Judaism in, uh, in, uh, in, in this period of time uh, was a common thing. Those who were not ethnically speaking Jews uh, but on the other hand, believed in the God of Israel. And so they became what were called proselytes or converts to Judaism. And so God's heart for the Gentiles always gave allowance and a way for people to come and tie themselves to the Lord to become part of the commonwealth, part of the covenant, uh, even though they were not born into it per se. And so God's love for, you know, it, it helps us to understand that when John writes that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, 
uh, when John in chapter 1, verse 1, and maybe we'll just go ahead and end with this passage, because this one I did jot down so I wouldn't get all turned around on it. But in John chapter 1, of course, we have the, the prologue here, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and so on there. Um, but you'll notice here in verse, um, in verse 11 how it says, uh, John records that Jesus, when he came into the world, or when the Word became flesh, ultimately, in verse 14 we see, when Jesus came to the world, uh, he came first to his own, right? His own people is in, in view there. He came first to the Jews. Um, but his own did not receive him. By and large, the Jews rejected him. There were, of course, his followers, the disciples. There were the multitudes that followed. But nationally speaking, he was rejected. We see this in Luke chapter 16 and so forth. Uh, however, John goes on to say, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so, yes, he came to his own and he was rejected. He will be received by them one day. They'll look upon him whom they've pierced, we see in Zechariah. Uh, and they'll mourn over him like one over an only son in that. But as Paul would go on to say in, in uh, chapter 11 of Romans, that all Israel will be saved. But in terms of his rejection during that time, it does open the door for the Gentiles to be saved. All who would believe would become children, not by their own will or by the will of the flesh, but by the will of God. Here in Acts chapter 10, we begin to see the official opening of the door to the Gentiles. Now, of course, as the ministry of the disciples goes on, Peter's focus will be much more geared toward the, the Jews, and Paul's will be much more focused toward the Gentiles. We see this in Galatians 2 verse 8. Um, however, uh, both of them do minister to those whom they were not, quote-unquote, the apostles to. Uh, it's just that the main thrust of their ministries tended to focus on those two groups, Paul's with the Gentiles, uh, Peter with the Jews. I always find that interesting, by the way. Uh, you know, with Paul, uh, having such knowledge of the Jewish faith, being a Pharisee, being a member of uh, the Jewish leadership and re uh, religious custodian for the people of Israel, um, that he would be sent to the Gentiles and not to the Jews. It's interesting how God chose to work that way, where Paul becomes really predominantly a minister, a minister to the Gentiles, and Peter remains more a minister to the Jews. Um, just interesting. Just interesting thing to think about and consider and to just sort of watch unfold in the book of Acts as we go through, and certainly in the epistles as they're written. But um, that said, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'm glad we actually got the whole thing in, and it wasn't too terribly... Uh, long compared to some of our studies. But we got through chapter 10 here as we see the opening of the, the, the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, in the next few chapters, we'll see where it, uh, they, they begin to wrestle with this a little bit until it ultimately comes to where they have a council there at Antioch. And we see this, um, uh, or I'm sorry, in uh, Jerusalem, not Antioch, Jerusalem, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 15, where we begin to understand, as we said earlier, uh, that the gospel now becomes something that people come to directly and not by the way of coming through the law. That's an enormous point for us to understand in our day because frankly there are a lot of Christians who really don't seem to uh, understand the place of the law in relation to God's overall plans and purposes. Uh, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking that the law brings us some kind of justification. Um, but as Paul himself said, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, but rather we are saved, as he would say many times and in many occasions, we are saved fully by grace. And if we add anything to grace, it ceases to be grace. So that being said, we'll talk more about this in the pages and days to come. But for now, thanks for watching and thanks for joining in as we make our way through this all important book. Uh, helping us to understand how we might apply the gospel, how we might live it out, how we might seek to live on such reliance on the Holy Spirit, even as they did then uh, in the days in which we live. So, Father, thank you for giving us these words. Thank you for helping us to make our way through them, uh, that we might uh, understand and apply those truths that are in the Scripture right here before us. We pray that uh, our, own, uh, our own lives would be marked by a reliance upon the Holy Spirit, a desire to walk with you with intention and fervency, with a desire to serve and minister to those around us in really whatever uh, capacity you might call us for and ultimately not only call us but equip us for. So thank you, Lord. We thank you that, especially as Gentiles, that, Father, the gospel has come forth to us as well, that, Father, we don't 
Uh, it's not a matter of, 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 you know, what ethnicity or background or anything like that. Uh, it's not a matter of any of those things, but simply a matter of receiving by faith that which you have graciously given us. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're male or female, Scythian or free, uh, or, or Greek, slave or free, any of these kinds of things. It's all about your grace. So thank you for calling us and for saving us and setting us free. And we pray that you bless our times together as we continue to make our way through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have any comments or anything like that, feel free to share them on our YouTube channel or on my personal website at parsonspad.com. Uh, you're also able to email me from there as well. I noticed some of you take advantage of that and, uh, and uh, I try to respond to your comments and emails in a pretty timely fashion. Um, sorry, they said hi again. But um, Or if you uh, want to um, listen to our audio version of this podcast, you can also subscribe to it on uh, parsonspad.com. You can click on the link and then you can choose whatever podcasting outlet you'd like to listen through. Uh, if you want to learn more about our church at Calvary Chapel Franklin in Tennessee, we invite you to check out our website at uh, calvarychapelfranklin.com. And of course, if you're ever in Middle Tennessee driving through the Nashville area and you come around uh, a little southwest of there and you come to Franklin, we'd love to have you pay us a visit on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. So uh, look forward to meeting you. But um, God bless you. Thanks for watching. And we'll catch up with you next time. And until then, God bless.